We're advancing into a future that's taking new shape every day. What will our world look like in 50 years? Fully automated cities and flying cars? Will our children have artificial organs? Will they live to be a hundred? Top international scientists look half a century ahead. Their discoveries will change the world. Fasten your seatbelts. This is the adventure of the future. When you think about the city of the future, we always imagine flying cars and ultra-modern architecture. But the real revolution in 50 years could be invisible. Consider this. When your parents were born, the PC didn't even exist. And today, every mobile phone has more memory than all the early computers. Now think 50 years out into the future, and you can begin to imagine the enormous possibilities for the city of the future. 50 years from now, a city of the future. It is afternoon. There are still schoolboys here, like 13-year-old Paul, but his route home is very different from that of today's kids. Hey, I'll race you to the hot dog stand. Go! Paul's holographic dolphin, the streets, the buildings, and everyone's clothes are constantly processing gigabytes of information. Hey, you cheated! You went through them, I saw it! The usual, please. Sure, Paul. The citizens of the city of the future are swimming in a 24-hour torrent of data. And that isn't the only big difference from today. What will a city in the West look like in the next 50 years? Let's do a little experiment. Go outside your front door and imagine that every 10th person is over 80 and every third person has reached the age of 60. Now, if you live outside the metropolitan areas, whole regions could be deserted. Now, why is this? Because outside of the United States, in the Western world, people are having fewer and fewer children. We're being hit by a double whammy, an aging population coupled with a declining birth rate. Quite simply, the birth rate is beginning to fall beneath the death rate. The aging society of the future may be a problem, but it could bring this advantage. It could ease the shortage of housing and jobs. Hi, Mom. Mm. Hi, honey. You're home early. How was school? Fine, thanks, Mom. Things still tense? Not for long. Hey, I'll see you tomorrow, honey. Bye. See you tomorrow. And don't spend all your time playing with that silly holophone. I won't, Mom. Taxi. This is Paul's grandpa, John. He's a computer freak and a first-generation hacker, and he's one of the few people in 2057 who still know what a keyboard and mouse look like. Asimo packing, not unpacking, I you idiot. Sorry. I said put it in. I need the blowtorch. Oh, hi, Gramps. Hi. Why don't you get the pile of junk and upgrade? Please this thing's so old, it's got no online connection. I can't get any upgrades anyway. It's probably time to track him. Here you go. Oh. Grandpa, why do you always eat hot dogs? Oh, what's wrong with hot dog? Oh, no. Please, Grandpa, not again. Sorry. This time I'm going for good. What did you argue about this time? I'm a bad influence, and I'm irresponsible. She happened to catch me putting the finishing touches to your new friend. You know what she says about that? How far have you got with it? It's finished. It's on your desk. To the annoyance of his mother, Paul's favorite game is playing with his virtual friends, who are barely distinguishable from reality. Wow! Hello, Paul. You can talk. Yes. Well, come on, show me a few moves. With pleasure. These 3D images are more than just playmates. We will interact with them in hundreds of different ways through medicine, advertisements, Whoa. video games. Now, today's TV and computer monitors will seem as ancient to our grandchildren as the horse and buggy. In the future, these 3D images will no longer be confined to a traditional PC screen. Instead, they will leap out. They will jump, they will play, they will fly and float. We will interact with them 24 hours a day. But how close are we to that now? 
For 40 years, scientists all over the world have been trying to solve one tricky problem. How can you project freestanding 3D images in mid-air? We still don't have the final answer, but a team in California has made some remarkable progress. They project pictures onto a special layer of mist without a screen. Hey, Esmo, can you see me? It's different from a normal display because on a fog screen, you can see both the front and the back of the projected yeah, picture. Okay, that's fine. Well, you look a little like a ghost. I can see it through you. Whenever uh, people actually see the fog screen, they reach in. When they see faces, uh, they get closer, they change the viewing angle. They just behave more lifelike. The fog screen is linked to four infrared cameras, so it can even react to a viewer's movements. Each camera constantly measures the distance from this cap to the infrared transmitter, so the computer can follow every movement of whoever's wearing the cap. OK, we can go ahead and start now. For the first test, the researchers have borrowed Paul's shark. It should follow Tobias Hullerer's movements. And so it does. The shark and the scientists seem to be invisibly linked. Tobias can steer the fish in the fog with neither mouse nor keyboard. But in daylight, this system doesn't work at all. So scientists are working on other ways to bring virtual worlds into the living room. And this may be the most remarkable technology yet created. It's developed by the Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute, a display that simulates 3D images. Special software creates two slightly different views of each image. Two different views are always needed for stereoscopic vision. If you can direct one to the left eye and one to the right eye, the brain will construct a 3D picture. But how can the two pictures simultaneously be directed to our left and right eyes? The solution is provided by this sheet of glass. Put it in front of a monitor and the sheet activates you can see its special features under a magnifying glass. These simple regular grooves are central to the success of the system. Look at these very fine vertical stripes. It's as if we had set 600 lenses side by side on the display, and these lenses allow us to project the right picture into the right eye and the left picture into the left eye. The final stage is the alignment of the two cameras. They're observing Klaus Schenker's movements. The images are checked by software that's constantly analyzing the position of Schenker's eyes. The glass sheet in front of the monitor is mechanically moved to follow Klaus Schenker's eye movement. So his left eye always sees the picture for the left eye, and his right eye always sees the picture for the right eye. Next, an infrared sensor is installed that transmits every hand movement to the computer. Now everything's ready. A click in the air and a 3D picture is floating in front of Schenker's eyes. Our camera can't see it, so here it's simulated, but Schenker really can see it. They've already built displays that can be watched by up to eight viewers at once. So 3D TV is theoretically possible for the whole family but it'll be decades before we can expect to see anything like Paul's shark swimming through our front room. The picture I can see now is not yet anywhere near as realistic as the one in Paul's room. For that, you would need a display that's actually invisible and could be viewed from every part of a room. We have yet to come up with the ideas that will let us achieve that. Hey. Wait a minute. Scientists expect that in 50 years, these virtual companions really will speak to us. Hey, folks. If they were displayed on tethered or mobile balloons, they could even fill the skies. Hey, I got it! And that has given Paul a brilliant idea, to use a digital shortcut to plaster his shark onto all the display surfaces of the city. It won't be easy, even for the grandson of a hacker. 
the security experts of the big corporations have worked with the government to design highly effective digital defenses for the city of the future. Man, how come it always works for Grandpa? Let me out of here, Paul. Please. please oh, I know. Please. Please, Paul, please. Hey, buddy. What's up? I think this is how he does it. But even in the future, there will be no absolutely fail-safe systems. Professionals know where to look for the weak spots. Cool. I'm in. Whoa! At the same moment, Paul's mother is on her way to work on an underground highway. She's on night shift at police headquarters. She uses the driving time to check out the latest shoes at her favorite virtual boutique. Yes? Georgina, where are you? On my way. What's up? We got a problem. A bunch of data control systems have been sending error messages. We're working on it, but when are you going to be here? Computer says six minutes on subterranean auto drive. Good. See you then. OK. Nobody's steering. 100 kilometers an hour on automatic pilot. Wouldn't it be great if you jumped into your car, told it where to go, and the car drove itself without your ever touching the steering wheel? Wouldn't it be great if there were billions of chips stored in the road, each costing a penny, eliminating traffic jams and even car accidents? Now, as ambitious as all this seems, this technology is coming. So get ready for the driving experience of your life. Not everyone will like it. Two-thirds of drivers enjoy speed, and they like their sense of freedom. That's all right if you're alone on a test track. But on a highway, instincts like that can get you into trouble. We have alone in Germany over 5,000 5, driving fatalities a year in Germany alone are a strong motivation for us to work on reducing that number. The first step towards the autonomous automobile is the development of a system that will prevent collisions. This radar sensor will be developed into an electronic eye that can recognize almost any kind of obstacle. The car's brain is a set of computers packed into the trunk. From speed and distance data, it can calculate when a crash is imminent. It took a year to develop the software. Now it's time to try it out with a collision trial on Audi's test track, well away from prying eyes. These foam blocks have a high metal content to make them visible to radar sensors. But only the car on the left is fitted with the sensors. The speed of the test is 30 kilometers an hour, and neither driver is allowed to brake. The sensors of the car on the left are constantly measuring the distance to all possible obstacles. And this is the moment of truth. The computer has calculated that it is now no longer possible to avoid the blocks, so it immediately gives the signal to brake hard. Steel clamps steel, and without a single movement from the driver, the car stops just in front of the blocks. Test two, 80 kilometers an hour. The sensor spots the obstacle, but it breaks too late. At this speed, the software can't decide if the driver hasn't seen the obstacle or simply intends to pull out to pass it. But that will soon change. Audi's experts are now doing some of the first in-depth research into the behavior of that little known species, the driver. Infrared cameras record every move. They're looking for behavior patterns that will let the computer predict what the driver is going to do. The onboard computer will watch everything the driver does, just like an instructor, and will only intervene if something goes wrong. The computer can already tell, just from the frequency of his blinking and the direction of his glance, how well a driver is concentrating and what he's concentrating on. But there's a long way to go before a computer can take full control of both car and driver. Our ability to absorb information is simply astounding. We're able to recognize scenes we've never seen before, to immediately identify people in these scenes, or to identify dangerous objects in our way. 
Building all that into a computer would be a huge achievement. 10,000 kilometers further west, American scientists are attempting something even more radical. These are the first entirely driverless cars. Each car has eight kilometers of cables and wires linking steering wheel, accelerator and brake with cameras and a GPS system. And the most important part is the software they've been developing over the past six months. Well, for me, since I wrote the software, the biggest fear for me is that something I wrote dies for a silly reason. That is my biggest nightmare. In a few minutes, this car will be off on a 200 kilometer race organized by the US Military Research Institute, DARPA. Spider, the car built by Cornell University, has done well in the qualifying rounds. But now, in the final, this car must safely negotiate mountain passes and tunnels. The big favorite is Stanford University's Stanley. Once the race starts, all 23 cars are on their own. Steering wheels steer, but there's no one there. Only the world's media. Identifying obstacles, calculating sizes and distances, working out avoidance strategies, humans do all this in fractions of a second. Spider has to work it out step by step. Whenever Spider moves, a warning signal sounds, because no one yet completely trusts its independent maneuvers. It makes a rather hesitant approach to the obstacle, but it does find the right way. But within an hour, Spider is out of action, like most of the other cars. 18 of the 23 vehicles suffer system failures. You wouldn't want to see one of these too close to a pedestrian crossing. But at the toughest part of the course, something really remarkable is happening. The favorite has managed to get over the mountain pass and is on its way to the finishing line. Four other cars follow behind. I really think that in the future we could easily have cars and trucks where the humans don't have to make any decisions, where that all of the human errors and everything like that that causes problems can be avoided, and I think we can get there in the 50 years. On the intelligent streets of the future, the cars speed on while their passengers just take it easy. Meanwhile, Paul is amazed at his success. Wow, that's wild. It works. The shark is out there. Hey, how is it up there. He's on a digital journey into the city center of the future. Screen by screen, the city turns into shark town Buildings out of a biological microcosmos spiral into the sky. Parks and forests float at dizzying heights. Nature has taken over the city's architecture. But the greatest revolution is the invisible one. Billions of computer chips link hospitals, police, fire and railroad stations as inextricably as if they were the cells of a single living organism. In 50 years, the brain of the whole city could be a single, highly efficient nerve center, like a contemporary traffic control center, but its capabilities would be infinitely greater. In an emergency, the whole city can be run by computer. Power stations and railroads can be shut down. Cars can be remote controlled like toys. And the network is present in the smallest things. Everyone uses it every minute of the day. ID scan successful. Welcome, Mr. Skiwi. Thank you. You can take over a taxi using your fingerprint and simultaneously log in to your home. Your friends will never again wait outside your front door because you're late getting back. What is your destination, please? 21 First Street. Thank you. Hi, it's me. Hi. I know, I'm a bit early. Doesn't matter. Just go in and make yourself at home. Yeah, I'll see you inside. See you. You will let the home of the future know who's allowed in and who isn't. The whole time, the streams of data are invisibly communicating. As soon as an authorized person comes in, a room is woken up by the central computer to cater to their needs. If you want, the bathroom floor weighs you. Or if this is the evening after an especially good dinner, it doesn't. 
Your favorite TV programs are ready to run and the temperature and humidity levels are set exactly as you like them. The fridge has restocked itself after the weekend by contacting the supplier direct. Right now the scanner is checking all the sell-by dates. If something's still missing, even this fridge can't anticipate sudden cravings, the online supermarket is always available. It'll deliver at any time of the day or night. There's no question that the network city will have its advantages. Just think, grocery shopping from your couch. Your intelligent clothing will call an ambulance in case of an emergency. The GPS system will locate free parking slots. Sounds good to me. But you know, all of this comes with a warning. As we become more dependent on technology, just remember, even in the future, computers can crash, technology can fail. The Achilles heel of tomorrow's megacities are the all-important data networks. According to the FBI, US police forces will have cyber action teams in 50 years. They'll be there to fight assaults on the information arteries of the city. Georgina Gator. Paul's mother is in charge of one of these units. Their special responsibility is to protect communication and transport networks. The train stopped moving 20 minutes ago. Two minutes ago, this happened. A traffic jam. Last time I saw something like that was uh, 20 years ago. So do you like him? Let's see what he can do. Uh, he's... Where is he? It's totally crazy, Gramps. Uh... Oh, no, you can't do that. I need Did to bring him. Did you clip that thing on there? Uh, no. I think I'll take this with me after all. Oh, no, Grandpa, please. Oh, Polly. I'm not going away forever. I'll call you. Just as soon as I find somewhere to live, OK? Come on. No, I mean I need that laptop. Uh, oh, so that's why. No, Grandpa. Uh, we have yes. To take uh, well, have I left anything else? Thing. No, I don't think so. Come on, Asimo. Let's go. Uh. I do recognize you. You are Paul. OK. The rust bucket can stay. Just take it to the junkyard when it starts to get near nerves, okay? Good morning, Paul. Where is your shark? I have a new program. May I have this dance sidestep? At the same time, the situation in the Department for Essential Infrastructure is getting critical. The city's firewall is crumbling. We nearly had a disaster at the airport. The flight traffic management system is completely jammed, and the fire department's been called out 27 times on false alarm in the last hour alone. The system's gone completely haywire. That's it. Red alert. Secure all public buildings. The high-tech city is demonstrating its vulnerability. When the stream of data dries up, the network world stops functioning. I'm looking for the Senior Commissioner for Critical Infrastructures. That's me, Georgina Gator. What can I do for you? Data Security, CityCon. I would have called, but all our lines are crashing. It's a virus in the central CityCon system. But how is that possible? Well, actually, it shouldn't be possible. But somehow, the Red Devil got through anyway. What Red Devil? Haven't you seen it? No. Bring up the city on your display. In less than five hours since the shop was let out, he has spread like an epidemic over the whole of the city's network. This thing is the problem? Well, kind of. It's attached to a virus, which is scanning the entire city for displays and holograms for the shark to invade. There are millions of them, so it's clogging the whole network. We don't know who the hacker is, but we know how he got in. How? He got access via the internal system of the police department. But how is that possible? Gina Gator. Home run, have to learn that. You can't even untie yourself. You're totally useless. 
You pathetic piece of junk. Automodus run. Check neck. Check shoulder joints. Check camera one. Paul? Sweetie, put Gramps on the phone. What's wrong? Have you looked out the window today? Your grandfather hacked your shark into the sky. Exactly what he and I were fighting about this morning. And he did it using my internal server access. Mom, the I... Paul, sweetie, he's got to turn himself in. Now get him on the phone. Mom, he left because of your argument. Paul? Mom, hello? Paul! As the last means of communication break down, Georgina is left with only one choice. Everybody, listen up. We're initiating a citywide search. This is our man. His name is John Gator, my father. He's one of those old school hackers. He once did eight years in prison for hacking into the medical insurer's database. He nearly wiped it out. He was trying to stop a genetic census. Look, he tried to do a lot of things, but he never succeeded. Screen on. Screen on. I have to hurry. I don't know how long the secure link will last. Guys, I think I've found something big. This virus is running on 50-year-old code. It has attacked the ancient base layer of the city's operating system. We've got our best people working on it, but I don't know what's going to happen. I think we should prepare for the worst. Screen off. When people think about terrorism, they imagine dirty bombs and biological weapons. But for a crisis expert, there's a new type of threat that's just as catastrophic, and that's computer hacking. And one dangerous form is called social hacking. That's when someone gains access to a corporate or government computer using a password taken from a friend or a relative. From that vantage point, they can paralyze a modern city. They can disrupt water, food, transportation, electricity, and they can collapse the entire economy. Grandpa! Polly, over here. Grandpa! Grandpa! That's your shark. Grant, need a help? What? I use your old trick, and then I just attached it to the shark, so we could fly across With the With my old virus? Grant, Mom thinks it was you. They're looking for you. Gramps, please help me. Paul, you didn't go online using your own computer, did you? Yes. You know, they'll find your data on the system just as soon as they reboot it. Can you fix it? You've crashed the entire network. To fix it, I'd have to access the Central City server. They've got more security than the Pentagon. There's only one thing we can do. Come on. One after another, the city's data networks are collapsing. Only the high security services remain virus free. Some main networks like hospitals and police have their own sophisticated protection systems. It's the last line of defense, a kind of life insurance for a city dependent on data flow. Meanwhile, Georgina is doing everything she can to find her father. A uh, mixture of satellite and terrestrial cameras, okay? Okay, start with the outskirts. And go. At the press of a button, hundreds of thousands of eyes are observing the city of the future. Nations around the world are installing millions of surveillance cameras to protect their citizens. And Great Britain is leading the way with 4.2 million surveillance cameras that can photograph each citizen 300 times a day. Now, that may sound excessive, but public acceptance rises every time they capture a terrorist or a child abductor. Now, these cameras have limitations. They can basically record, but they cannot identify. That's why computer scientists are now building the next generation of intelligent camera surveillance systems. One of the most powerful surveillance technologies of the future is currently under development in London. It's already the most closely monitored city in the world. Now these cameras are to learn to see intelligently. 
The scientists have connected them to revolutionary new software. Hi, my friend. I can hear you. Okay, can you see the cameras? They are around. The system has to tail this man like a detective. Okay, okay. Big Brother is stirring. You can go now. The first test involves just one camera. The software checks the live pictures every second for moving objects or people. When the computer has zeroed in on the test person, it must keep the camera trained on him and even predict his movements. Ah, here is. We track him. It will take into account his size, speed, and direction of movement. The system functions extremely well. The software follows the person exactly as planned. The red box shows where the person is at this moment, and the black box predicts where he will be a second from now. And you can't shake off the system just by moving out of sight of a camera. The scientists are already linking the cameras in the first networks. They'll be hunting together in packs. OK, James, can you start it now? Thank you. If everything goes as planned, our camera network will keep a man in its sights. When he goes out of range of the first camera, he will disappear into the blind spot we have built into the system. Then the second camera should pick him up and identify him via his size and direction of movement. And then the third camera will take over and so on. This test is the basis for a system that should in future be able to track down any person in the city. Camera 1 sees the person and gives him the identification number 2. The next camera identifies the same man as number 2. But camera 3 makes a mistake. And there's a simple reason for that. The only sure way to recognize people is by their faces. And today's two-dimensional cameras are often not up to the job. Even human beings have trouble identifying the same person on photos taken from different angles. A computer has no chance at all, except in ideal conditions. With a 2D photo, several factors make a positive identification virtually impossible. If we look at this picture here, we see that it's taken from a high angle and is strongly lit from the side. This picture up here is taken from a low angle and is lit even more strongly from the side, so it's very difficult to compare the two pictures. The team have been working on a 3D face recognition system for three years. It started with measurements of classical statues. It could soon be a way of checking up on our every move. It's a new form of surveillance. The cameras in this system project a striped grid on top of the recorded TV picture and send the combination to Henning Dam's computer. Seconds later, Julia Meyer is in the data bank, along with a 3D model of her face. Now, this device has to recognize Julia Meyer again. To make things more difficult, they switch the light off. Henning Daum explains what's happening inside. This is a normal 2D picture in which you can see the whole face. But we just need the depth measurements of the face, the distance of each part of the face from the camera. It's like a mask on which the face is displayed in three dimensions. If a mask in your computer and a newly recorded mask fit together well, it's the same person. If they don't, it's two different people. Here, the reference image has been checked, and Ms. Meyer was recognized perfectly. Die Frau Meier wurde perfekt erkannt. Under laboratory conditions, this system recognizes faces with almost 100% accuracy. Now, the researchers want to prepare the system to put it on the street and install it over entire cities. 
In 50 years, we'll no longer be working with visible light. It'll be invisible. The grid will no longer be stripes, but rings. The whole thing will be integrated into the camera, so the camera itself will make the 3D images. And Georgina could use a network of cameras like this to search for her father. Bingo! Bilo Drive, Commissioner. Heading north. Where is he going? Can you make a prediction? System program predicts. Destination is... Hall! Municipal Archives. Where is he going? A few kilometers away, near the city com, John has been searching for hours for a way to hack into the city's central computer. But now, the virus has blocked the digital arteries of the city. John's last hope is the central archive. I need the data from the old city administration, now. What data? Do the original maps still exist? We have something even better. Yeah, maps, maps. Come with me. How many CDs do you have containing music and video? Well, I hate to tell you this, but in the future, much of that information could become unreadable because your computer is obsolete. Now, if you think you have lots of important data, just think of the national archives and libraries of the world. Now, there is a solution to the problem. Holographic crystals can store up to 200 DVDs worth of information for a thousand years, either as digits or as microscopic images. This means that you could read the data even without a computer. Many scientists have gone even further. They're working on data crystals that will store especially important information in a form that you can read by the light of a candle, the same way you project a transparency onto a wall. However, most crystals today can only be read by a laser. There it is. I know it. Is that the main computer glimpse? Not quite, my boy, not quite. We'd never get in there, but this is the next best thing. Dad, oh, do no. you have any idea what you've done? I'm going to lose my job, and you're going back to jail. Yeah, Mom, I... it was me. Graham said nothing to do with Paul, you. Oh, you just stay out of No, it. Mom, it's true. But Graham's can fix it. We have to manipulate the main computer. Paul's identification data is still on it. I'm hoping to get access using a little detour. You mean to tell me that a 13-year-old boy did this? Yes. Well, he did use my technology. OK, split up. Go. Go, go. Georgina, focus. We have to get out of here and fix this thing before it's too late. No, you fix it. Paul stays with me. No, Mom, we both have to go. I know the new computer's better. OK, go. What do you want me to do? Keep him here. Stall him. How much time do you need? 20 minutes. Go, go. Go. Where is he? I don't know. I must have just missed him. The entrance has to be around here somewhere. Here, that's it. It has to be. It's locked. Shoot. Oh, shoot. I've got everything here but the blowtorch. Maybe it's in here. No, that's clothes. Hello, Paul. I do recognize you. I have seen your shark everywhere. Save. At the last minute, John's personal robot has brought the urgently needed tool, as if he could read John's mind. This could be science fiction. OK, drop it off. Good boy. You are welcome. We've seen movies like Star Wars and iRobot, films with fantastic robots, companions with far superior intellect and strength. So. Where have all the cool robots gone? I mean, look at Asimo, slow, clunky, can barely deliver a blowtorch. 
And even those behaviors would require new breakthroughs in human-like sensing and decision-making and thinking. Now, progress in this field will be slow for the next 50 years. But don't get me wrong, there will be breakthroughs. But just don't expect that any Asimo-like robot will be babysitting your grandchildren. Asimo was a special challenge for his engineers right from the beginning. This was a 10-year project, a dream, to build the best humanoid robot in the world. The toughest nut to crack was simply walking upright. Today, he makes it look easy, but for a long time, it seemed like an insoluble problem. The story of this mechanized biped goes back 20 years. Back then, he took 30 seconds for a single step. Our sense of balance, calling for complete coordination of feet, knees and hips, turned out to be extremely complex. But his creators didn't give up. By 1996, Asimo was on his feet. The first two-footed machine in history went for a walk. Today, Asimo is almost as steady on his feet as a human being. His balance system even lets him turn and shift his weight. And he even has his advanced locomotion certificate. He can climb stairs. It looks great, but Asimo can't make any of these movements independently. Each step is programmed, otherwise he'd fall. Today's robots are programmed for a specific situation and for a specific task. Good morning. How do you feel? I'm feeling great, thank you. That's chickens. The programmer mustn't change a single word in his sentences. Even the distance between the scientist and the robot must be right if the robot is to respond. Okay, let's shake hands. If the environment changes or the activity takes place in another context, these robots are helpless. Go where I am pointing. I'm not sure where you're pointing. Go where I am pointing. Where shall I go? I know you. Pascal. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> go where I am pointing. I'm not sure where you're pointing. Okay. Let's shake hands. Thus we need simple, flexible systems able to learn from experience. So it's time for Asimo's training platform to go to school. Asimo has to learn something very basic, how to learn. It's essential if he's ever to cope with unfamiliar situations. This is a lesson about new objects. Apple. Okay, did you say apple? Yes, this is correct. Okay. Man in the moon. Okay. Hairbrush. Okay. Once again, human beings okay. are the model for the new learning software. Asimo learns the same way small children store new objects in their brains. Please show something. Please show something. Now, Asimo quickly recognizes objects he's learned about. Airbrush. Maybe man in the moon. Man in the moon. Please show something. Unknown object. Teddy bear. Did you say teddy bear? Yes, this is correct. Okay. Please show something. He's very good at storing new information and he can retrieve it when it's needed. Teddy bear. Yes, this is correct. Now comes a more difficult test. And this is the first time it's been filmed. Today, Asimo will be asked to act independently. The researchers have set him a tiny task, but they haven't fully programmed his response. They've left him a little freedom of action. We have given our robot the task of picking up a bottle, and he has four possible ways of carrying it out. Asimo has been trained with this green bottle, like a dog with a stick. 
As soon as the robot spots the object of his desires, he approaches it movement by movement. Each millisecond, he makes new calculations about the best way to get to the bottle. If he can't reach it with the left hand, he tries the right. Our robot isn't programmed, and he isn't carrying out any pre-programmed movements. We set the goal, and he develops the movements all by himself to pursue this goal. During these simple movements, highly complex programs are running in Asimov's computer brain. He must see, calculate distances and positions, and know what he should concentrate on. At the same time, he must pass on the results of his calculations to the joints of his body and then make a sensible, effective movement, something we humans do without much thought, all our waking hours. Of course, this is just the beginning of flexible, interactive behavior. If we want to achieve more complex behavior, like going shopping in a supermarket, crossing a street, or helping a human being, then this robot will have to have a much greater number of behavioral options to choose from. And looking forward 20, 30, or maybe even 50 years, he mustn't just wait for instructions. He must be able to analyze problems for himself and be at man's beck and call as a supportive machine. That's where he's going. It's close. Come on, let's go. John and Paul have almost reached their destination. This used to be the digital heart of the city, before technological progress left it far behind. Gramps, what is this place? Uh, over there is the old city information headquarters. When they built a new one, they closed this one down, but it's still connected to the central computer. Who would have thought that Azimuth would be the only piece of technology to survive my virus? Think about it. No online connection, no data, no virus. Thanks, pal. Keep moving. We haven't got much time. Keep going. First of all, we have to let the central computer know that this place is back in control. What is that? Mouse. A what? Mouse. What's it for? Okay, just let me do it. You have to go to SC Systems. I know. SC, they I know. Food. I know, I know. Slash. Old technology needs update. John works feverishly to extinguish the identification data his grandson left at the scene of the digital crime. Okay, Paul, you're safe. I erased your identification data. Okay, now what? <laughs> No, 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 no! What happened? I think I just corrupted the entire electrical supply. Well, why do you do that? Well, it wasn't deliberate. To run the antivirus program, I had to find a non-infected network, which was still clean. And then I had Not to... anymore. Not anymore. OK, let me do it. Gramps, I know how to fix it. You have to go to the inner core program. Yeah, that's good. Warning. 
system overload. Look, Dad, I know you tried. I don't get it, Georgie. It should have worked. Hey, I look know. over there! Release him. He's not our guy. In fact, he's just saved the whole city. Call Edward Gator. Get over here. Sharks. Stick to dolphins. <laughs> Why bother to predict the future if there's a rule of thumb that everything comes out differently anyway? Well, I'll tell you why. Predictions of the past were way off because we didn't understand the laws of nature. Well, today we have the atomic theory of chemistry. We have the quantum theory of physics. And we have the DNA theory of biology. So our predictions can be more accurate. Now, of course, we're still going to make huge blunders. But in my opinion, it's better to walk in a forest with foggy glasses than to be totally blind. People sometimes ask me, Professor, what is the number one challenge facing us for the next 50 years? And I say, hands down, it is energy. Energy to fuel our cars, cities, and industries. Energy to empower an exploding population, all without collapsing the environment. Well, that's a pretty tall order. However, I believe that the technological challenges may be many, but so are the possible solutions. 50 years from now, the Earth's population is 9 billion. Every day, the world economy consumes 30 billion liters of oil. Scientists are trying everything to find new sources of energy in the atom, at the bottom of the sea, even in space. One of the most ambitious research projects is anchored in the middle of the Pacific Ocean it's the base for a remarkable link to a space station 400 kilometers above the Earth. It looks like a gigantic merry-go-round, but it was once the great hope of China and the USA, a testbed of extremes to create the solar cells of the future. The experiments on Solaris were to have revolutionized the world's energy supplies, but the space energy project hasn't made the progress everyone hoped for. For five long years, astronaut and physicist Bob Sanders has worked with his colleague Wang Li Chao in search of an effective solar energy material. The Chinese-American team remain committed to their mission but they know that unless they can come up with something sensational in the next three weeks, the space station will be closed down. Shave. Morning, Bob. Morning, Michelle. Any good news? Not yet. Coffee? Perk you up? No, thanks. I've almost finished prepping another panel. Should be ready to go in a couple of minutes. Sounds good. I'll be there in a minute. You give me coffee with no coffee? I'm sorry, we've run out. Well, then order some more. I'm sorry, no more food orders. We have enough supplies until station shutdown. Great. Glad to be of service. Li Chao has just started today's run of tests. It begins with a chemical reaction between two fluids. Li Chao is sure that he only needs to find the correct proportions of the mix. The tests take place in the sunlight on the space station's solar ring. Robots move the samples into position. Any one of these panels could be the breakthrough into an age of unlimited energy. And there's nothing the world needs more urgently 
50 years from now. Harnessing solar energy is still considered too expensive, too inefficient to be a serious source of power. So why are scientists and oil companies spending millions of dollars investing in solar technology? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because sunlight is clean, it's safe, and oh yeah, it's also limitless. Now get your head around this fact. Every second of every day, the sun produces billions of times more energy than is consumed by the entire planet. The trick is catching it. The world's leading laboratory for solar cell testing is in Germany. It's known for its tough tests. Here, silicon panels are being put through their paces. The first challenge comes from two centimeter thick hailstones. They crash down onto the panels at 80 kilometers an hour. If the panels survive without a scratch, it's time for the next assault. A 45 kilo lead weight in free fall. Modern solar cells are ultra hard, super thin and shock resistant. The best are now deployed in every part of the world in all weathers. There's only one thing about them that is still a big disappointment. Tests in the sun simulator reveal how inefficient even the best solar cells are. The tests show how much of the light is transformed into electricity. The lamps are giving off enough energy every hour to power a desktop computer for three weeks. But how much of it is actually captured? The tests show that the solar cell could power the PC for just five days. That means just 18% of the energy has been transformed into electric current. The disappointing result is due to the characteristics of silicon. A silicon cell can only process light from a small part of the sun's spectrum, close to the infrared area. No more than 30%. So 70% of the sun's energy is lost. But within 50 years, a completely new material could revolutionize solar energy technology. At the University of Utrecht, physicists are experimenting with a method that could be the foundation for Bob and Lee Chow's experiments in space. Professor Daniel van Meckelberg and his team are using a series of vacuums cut off from air and humidity to grow what they call quantum points, tiny crystals invisible to the naked eye. They pour a fluid with semiconductor molecules into a hot solution. When the mixture changes color, they know they've created the quantum points. They make the quantum points in different sizes. To see why, you have to look at them in ultraviolet light. Depending on their size, the crystals absorb different light frequencies. This discovery has opened up a whole new area in solar power research. If it were possible to unite all these crystals in one material, it would be the perfect solar cell. This supermodule made of quantum points would be able to absorb the whole spectrum of sunlight. It could transform up to 86% of the sun's energy into electric power. It would change the world. Transforming the sun's energy into power for cars and houses, factories and entire cities. But the quantum points don't behave in quite the way Daniel van Meckelberg expected. When we put a drop of the quantum point solution on a base, we usually get an irregular structure like this one. But for a good solar cell, we need an absolutely regular structure with as few holes or other flaws as possible. That's the only way that strong connections between the individual crystals can be built up and for the energy to flow in the best way possible. Then we could build the best possible solar cell. An electron microscope will show whether they're making any progress toward their goal. The crystal samples are first brought into a completely dust-free vacuum.
A tiny probe is now scanning the sample, atom by atom. The computer is building an image magnified a hundred million times. In this test, the structure has been successfully achieved, and the experts believe that one day the last flaws will be eliminated. The dream is simply to no longer be dependent on fossil fuels. If we could really succeed in harvesting the energy of the sun and using it efficiently, we would have solved many of our energy problems. A breakthrough in solar energy would mean the end of the age of oil. But great inventions and discoveries often need decades to come to fruition, and their inventors need patience. With time and patience, the mulberry leaf becomes a silk gown. Confucius. Try again. German Mao. Chinese proverb. That was my next guess. I'm sorry. I'm patient, but we're running out of time on this. I know we can get to 80%. So do I. Let me take over. I'll clean the transmitter. Oh, uh, Paula should be here soon to check the photovoltaic generator. What about the new batch of test fluids we ordered? She's bringing them up. Finally, some good news. The fluids or Paula? <laughs> Paula Keller is an engineer at the European Space Agency. She's one of the Solaris ground crew. Every month, she flies to a platform built on a rock in mid-ocean. From here, she sets out into space to supply the scientists with test materials. The team on the space station are now working round the clock because of the imminent closure of their lab. Li Chao is cleaning the quantum transmitter after yet another series of tests. I'll get started with the next experiment. For the final series of the day, Bob selects the chemical ingredients the transmitter will turn into billions of tiny solar crystals. But this time, he misses a tiny detail. Hello, Paula. How are you today? Fine. How about a little bit more air conditioning? Sorry, we're conserving energy. Great. What's our travel time? Two hours, 23 minutes. Get ready for takeoff. Ready when you are. Three, two, one, takeoff. Paula's way of reaching space has nothing to do with today's rockets. She leaves Earth in an elevator. In the fairy tale Jack and the Beanstalk, a young boy climbs a beanstalk into the sky and reaches the clouds. Now, the 21st century version of this is called the Space Elevator. And oh yeah, it is physically possible. Now, amazing developments in nanotechnology may mean that in 50 years, a Sunday picnic in outer space may not be a fantasy. The concept for the Space Elevator was developed in New Mexico. Bradley Edwards was a physicist at Los Alamos National Labs. America's most famous research institute, when he came across a newspaper article. I started on the space elevator about seven, eight years ago when I saw a statement saying it couldn't be done. And for a physicist working on advanced concepts, that's red flag to a bull kind of thing. At the time, Bradley was working on Earth observation satellites. The cost of sterile laboratories and in-space construction was enormous. But the most expensive and most dangerous part of the mission was always the blast-off. Impressive the lift-off may be, but it costs $20,000 for every kilo put in space, with a great deal of risk. Rockets right now are exciting because there's danger, there's flame, there's... We don't want that. We want it to be boring. So you get on, you're not thinking about whether you're going to die, you're thinking about I'm going to go to space. I'm going to get there. When I get there, I'm going to do this. That's what we want. The basic idea is that of a simple elevator. A cable stretches 100,000 kilometers from the Earth into space. It's kept straight by a weight at the bottom and by centrifugal force. 
a capsule travels up and down along the cable. Slowly, over time, Edward's sketches became concrete proposals. The elevator could travel in each direction once a day. It would cost $20,000 per person instead of 20 million. Step by step, Edwards broke down the colossal plan into small, soluble problems. He calculated the radiation in space, the danger of collisions with space garbage, and the size of the Earth base station. As bad weather could threaten the elevator cable, he analyzed 10 years of weather records in order to pinpoint the best location for the Earth base. After painstaking comparisons, he found it. Close to the equator, a few hundred nautical miles off Mexico's Pacific coast, is the area with the most stable weather conditions in the world. One of the many unanswered questions involved the elevator capsule's power plant. How would it be supplied with energy at great distances from the Earth? Edwards worked with engineers to build a one-tenth scale model that set out the basic idea of the electricity supply system. A laser beam would supply energy to a solar cell on the elevator. But that's not the toughest problem. We have lots of, lots of challenges. The most challenging is the ribbon. We need to make the high strength materials. Uh, we need to make those into a ribbon. Right now, um, steel's not strong enough. Kevlar's not strong enough. No material that we have is strong enough other than the carbon nanotubes. One of the people working on this very special material is a colleague of Bradley Edwards. Yun Chian Zhu is a materials researcher at Los Alamos. He has one thing in common with Edwards. He loves challenges that other people think are impossible. He would build the ribbon not out of steel, but out of billions of individual carbon atoms. In a series of complex steps, he constructs narrow pipes 50 times stronger than steel carbon nanotubes. With the naked eye, they are completely invisible. They can only be seen with a high-powered electron microscope. They said it was impossible, but Yuntian did it in just two years. Not only were the carbon fibers indubitably there, they were longer than anyone could have dreamt possible. The team printed out 230 pictures from the microscope to demonstrate the length of their nanotubes. They'd reached exactly four centimeters, 13 times longer than anything achieved before, enough to think of moving on to the next stage. The challenge is to spin these long fibers into longer and thicker threads, According to Yuntian's calculations, this material would then be strong enough for a cable into space. The vision of a space elevator has moved one step closer to reality. Having it take us 50 years to get there, you need some sort of big surprises showing up to delay it that long. So I, I think 50 years will definitely have people going up, and it probably won't be just Bob and Lee Chow. It'll be tourists. It'll be um, more general public, in addition to workers, people going up for business, uh, scientists going up for studies. It's a very realistic scenario. Meanwhile, there is an unexpected incident on Solaris. What happened? I'm not sure. It seems to be acting up again. The sensors are measuring a breathtakingly high degree of efficiency, but only for a fraction of a second. The computer is fine. I just checked it yesterday. Then why did it spike? I'll scan the drives again. I'll be right back. Hi, darling. How are you? It's so hot. But I'm fine. I can feel the baby kicking all the time now. And look. It's just getting so big. They're gonna have to start thinking of names soon. I know. I've been thinking about that. Tian, I'm sorry. I need to call you back. Hello, Dr. Wang. Secretary Luo. 
What can I do for you, sir? Our base station informs me. You get pretty impressive results. Actually, sir, it's a false alarm. We're checking the equipment. Dr. Wang, when you do get a breakthrough, I want the data first. But there will be a breach of space law. And besides, Dr. Dr. Sanders... Dr. Wang, you're an officer of the Chinese army, and you will do as you're ordered. At this precise moment, the space elevator is racing towards the space station at a speed of 350 kilometers an hour, away from a world in which the energy crisis has taken a dramatic turn. Be liable for the mistakes politicians have made over the decades. Due to the worldwide energy crisis, the United States and China have entered a third round of emergency talks on Central Asian gas and oil supplies. The European Union will mediate. Experts speculate the U.S. may be forced to tap into its strategic reserves. After the last oil crisis, Germany, like many other European nations, needed an energy insurance policy, a strategic oil reserve of hundreds of millions of barrels of oil, enough to run the entire country for 90 days. Great. But what happens in the future when the world's entire supply of usable oil completely runs out? What then? Well, today, some researchers are trying to harness the power of the sun. Other researchers are even bolder. They want to create a sun. Of course, nobody actually wants to build an entire star. But physicists have managed to copy the sun's operating principle. At 15 million degrees centigrade, the sun melts hydrogen into helium. In this atomic fusion, a gram of hydrogen releases the same amount of energy as eight tons of oil. But the fire of the sun does not burn well on Earth. The problem of recreating a sunlight fusion on Earth is similar to that of making wet matches burn. It's very difficult. But in the last few decades, we've made a great deal of progress. To trigger the reaction, the hydrogen in this chamber is heated to 100 million degrees. Before the experiment can begin, a powerful magnetic field is activated as a heat shield to protect the huge plant. Finally, a two-meter-thick steel and concrete door seals the chamber. This protects the scientists in the control room. The process now being set in motion could in the future solve all our energy problems. Once the technology has matured, it should be possible to supply the energy needs of a family for a year with three bottles of water and a handful of minerals. According to today's plans, the first fusion reactor should be supplying electricity in 50 years' time, if fusion really works. At the Marum Institute in Bremen, Germany, a substance is being investigated that might come to the rescue sooner. In this depot, they're storing samples of an energy-rich substance that was only discovered by accident on a Siberian expedition a few decades ago. Methane hydrate, a form of ice that burns. Today, scientists know that it's present in colossal amounts in the depths of the oceans. A remote-controlled submarine is deployed to find out more about this potential new treasure trove. A thousand meters below the surface, it starts work with its cameras and instruments. The best place to look is where marine life is at its richest because wherever there's organic life, methane is created. And in the pressure of the ocean depths, the gas is combined with water into methane ice. The experts have been waiting a long time for these pictures. In the research vessel, an engineer is steering the robot, which will raise the methane ice. The team expect to encounter difficulties on the long way up to the ship. Every 100 meters, the water pressure and temperature change. At any moment, the ice could disintegrate. But this ice has an almost magic effect on the imaginations of energy researchers and economists. Estimated reserves could easily make up for expected shortages in oil supplies. 
We believe that there are maybe up to 10,000 gigatons of carbon in methane hydrate reserves. Given our estimated availability of coal, oil and gas, a total of 5,000 gigatons, our primal energy resources would simply double. On the last mission, the scientists finally succeeded in raising an airtight sample of methane hydrate. It should help them calculate the reserves much more accurately. Centimeter by centimeter, the ice core is scanned by computer tomography. Each layer confirms their expectations. The sea floor contains huge amounts of methane hydrate. But using it might be extremely dangerous. The one problem with methane hydrate as an energy source is that we will be producing CO2. And since the CO2 problem is already an acute one, we have to find alternative energy sources. But in 50 years, we'll probably have no other choice and just have to use methane hydrate as an energy source. The space elevator starts its docking maneuver with the space station. The elevator is guided into its place on the space lab via the ultra-strong space ribbon. Paula uses an airlock to move from the parking deck into the space station. Hello, Paula. Hi, Bob. How goes it? Yeah, you know, still plugging away. Maybe this will help. Ah, my coffee. Thank you, thank you, you're the best. Hey, besides the photovoltaic generator, we just found out we're having problems with the steering element on the laser beam. Yeah, sorry, but I have to stick to my work order. No extras, because of the shutdown. Well, you think maybe you can do it off the record? Back on Earth, one of the world's economic superpowers is steering straight towards a global energy crisis. Hospitals in Beijing and Shanghai are running on emergency power. Every gas station in the country has lines a kilometer long. And today we issued a ban on the use of air conditioners. What's the status on additional fuel? The Russians have reneged on our agreement and caught up on the gas prices. The Americans have negotiated a secret deal with Kazakhstan to increase their oil supplies by over 50%, which cuts our supplies in half. What do you suggest, Admiral? Take what's right for the hours. Occupy the Central Asian oil fields. Not yet. They'll mean all out war. I suggest more indirect action. Such as? Let our friends in Central Asia deal with the situation. You don't need a crystal ball to see that the superpowers of the future will be the United States and China. And there's an excellent chance that they'll be on friendly terms with one another. But consider this fact. The Chinese economy is growing exponentially. And so is its demand for energy. One estimate is that China will need to build four middle-level power plants per week for the next 50 years just to keep up with energy demands. So it's not too difficult to see that in the future, these superpowers will be competing fiercely for markets, natural resources, and most importantly, oil. That's the biggest increase in global temperature measurements in history. In Northern Africa and Southern Europe, as Paula does a full technical check on Solaris one last time before its closure, disturbing news reaches the space station from Earth. Last night, heavily armed masked bands took control of gas and oil pipelines in the troubled regions west of China, which for years have been plagued by guerrilla warfare. The U.S. government has strongly condemned their actions. We'll be back with more details after a short break. You're right. The computer's not broken. But what caused that 83% spike? No idea. My data got corrupted when the structure fell apart. Let's rerun that last test. See what happens. Just as Bob and Li Chao at last see a glimmer of hope in their experiments, in the USA, oil prices are going through the roof. The president calls a crisis meeting. As you know, several strategic gas and oil pipelines in Kazakhstan were seized last night. That means that delivery of our new supplies is now blocked. Mr. President, my team at National Security is putting together a full report. 
In the meantime, Dr. Fleming has an update on our energy status. Current supplies are good for eight to ten weeks, after which we'll have to tap into the strategic reserves. Either way, further electricity rationing seems inevitable, as do car-free weekends. Not exactly a catchy re-election slogan. Sir, do we know who's behind the raids on the pipelines? The CIA is still investigating. Sir, the military's operating under the assumption China staged the whole thing. That's entirely plausible, but we must proceed with caution until we've established all the facts. No overt military action. Yes, sir. May I suggest we send the surveillance and acquisition platoon from our Japanese base? Authorized to proceed. Okay, I'll see you guys. Wait. Wait, let me give you a hand. The photo generator running okay? Good as new. Laser? What can I say? I'm a hero. I hope I didn't waste your time. With the shutdown and everything. You can't quit on me now. The mechanics are taking bets on you guys. What? Yeah. What kind of odds they have on us? Hi. But I like long shots. Meanwhile, Li Chao continues his search for the cause of the unexpectedly high efficiency levels. And then he suddenly makes a discovery that recalls some of the other great moments in science. The discovery of dynamite, of penicillin, and the heart pacemaker all had one thing in common, the role of chance. I think I know what happened. What? The neutralizer interacted with the test fluids and created a new molecular structure. You think that's what happened? Let's add one drop at a time. You got it. If they can reconstruct the formula, this will be the beginning of a new age. Energy on demand, an engineer's dream. It could save the global climate. No more energy wars the way to a better world. molecular properties and quantum efficiency. I'll run it through the analyzer. We should have the data in a few hours. That was fast. Big Brother's watching. Well, you go talk to them. I'm sure I'm gonna get a phone call myself. <sighs> Hello, Lee Chao. So glad it's you. Where are you? In a hotel room. What's going on? It's a very nice hotel, Dr. Wang. Don't worry. Your wife is fine. A situation that could change very, very quick. You'll get the data first. That will no longer be sufficient. The Americans cannot have it at all. But Dr. Sanders is working on it now. Then you have to figure out a way to destroy it once you have got the results. How do I do that? You have exactly four hours. For Li Chao, it's an almost hopeless battle against the clock. Mr. President, we have some exciting news. The Solaris team has discovered a substance which has the capacity to transform more than 80% of sunlight into electricity. Congratulations, <laughs> well done. Mr. President, there is a problem though, sir. We are now positive that Beijing was behind the attacks on our Central Asian oil supplies. Well, China cannot be trusted. What do you suggest? Well, we Mr. keep President... the discovery to ourselves. Oh. We make the Chinese scientist a very generous offer. Beijing will go ballistic if they find out. Let's hope not, sir. The bottom line is we need those pipelines back. Mr. President. I request permission to put all our forces in Central Asia on standby 
I'd also like to authorize additional reconnaissance flights and deploy special forces near the pipelines. Permission granted. I'm a scientist, but I was once a soldier in the United States Infantry. And the Army drills into us one fundamental fact. It takes humans, not machines, to take and hold territory. This means that we will have robots and drones on the battlefield, but they'll be useless without their human controllers. Our soldiers are indispensable, and we will give them all the latest high-tech wizardry, including the possibility of becoming invisible. In the future, a soldier's most important piece of equipment will be his uniform. For the first time in history, weapons are no longer at the forefront of military research. The priority is protecting the fighter. The US Army is investing $50 million to develop a completely new kind of fabric. It'll be worn like a second skin. It'll camouflage and protect the soldier. And if necessary, it will save his life. The leap ahead would be the nanotechnology, where we would hope that we would have one textile that could act as body armor all the time and weigh a fraction of what traditional body armor would weigh. One fiftieth the thickness of human hair, the basic material the scientists will use to weave this bulletproof fabric. The science may be complex, but the idea is very simple. Microscopic particles of iron react instantly to a magnetic field. Thus, a fabric that contains them can change its characteristics in seconds. So this special liquid, which is a magnetorheological liquid, uh, in the absence of a magnetic field, has something in the consistency like a runny yogurt. Uh, but in the application of a magnetic field, it becomes the consistency of something like peanut butter. It has a yield stress. It's very difficult to push through. Uh, and one, this lends itself quite well to perhaps making a dynamic body armor for soldiers, something which is soft and pliable and adheres to the contours of a soldier's shape when not in use but in the incidence of uh, a blunt object or a bullet, could become stiff as a board. Thus, the firing of a bullet could lead to the creation of a magnetic field that would completely rearrange the molecules in the fabric, making it impenetrable. As if by magic, a soft material turns into armor plating. And the next step sounds even crazier. If the bullet does, after all, injure the soldier, then tiny artificial muscles in the uniform's fibers would go into action. Highly magnified, these fibers resemble small hinges. Their two wings are movable. Working together, they would apply emergency aid in the event of cardiac arrest and revive the soldier. And at the same time, the uniform would raise the alarm. One of our greatest challenges is command and control of our soldiers inside the battle space. So we're building that next generation system, the future combat system, that will not only allow me to see where my soldiers are, but also share information with them, leveraging data from other soldiers or unmanned ground or air vehicles to provide reconnaissance and information to the soldier as fast as possible. A satellite network would pick up the soldier's call for help and pass it on to the command center. the mission commander would immediately see the positions of all friendly and enemy soldiers on his screen. Camera drones would keep in contact with the medical teams to update them on the casualties situation. Rescue missions like this could be routine within 20 years. But in 50 years, they may even be unnecessary, for the military and researchers are working to make soldiers completely invisible. One possible method is based on a very simple idea. Imagine that cameras were integrated into the uniform and the uniform itself were a display. The cameras could always project an exact image of the soldier's surroundings onto his body. And at the touch of a button, he could melt into his environment. As with a lot of military technology, this idea first came out of a storyteller's imagination. The goal is to eventually get to what science fiction has told us from years past, is that the uniform becomes a mirror and you literally disappear inside the battle space. That would be something we'd hope to see in the 2050 time frame. In the Pentagon, the US Army Command are watching the progress of their invisible army. They've arrived. 
they've reached the pipelines unseen by the enemy. Meanwhile, up in the space station, the consequences of the political unrest are making themselves felt. Listen, uh, hey, child, we need to talk. First off, I checked the home base. Uh, promised to send them the data ASAP. What? Why did you do that? That's standard procedure. You should have spoken to me first! Hey, child. What'd they say to you? They abducted my wife. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. My government is demanding the formula for themselves. Bob, you have to help me. I have less than four hours to send Beijing the formula and destroy the data. I got it. We have to turn the tables on then. Attack them where they're unprepared and appear where you're not expected. Sun Tzu? The art of war? Required freshman reading. So where do we appear unexpected? Right there. We send a message out to the public so China can't touch Tian. There's no way! All our communication lines are monitored! Wait, I have an idea. You ever heard of a message in a bottle? Paula Keller? Dr. Keller, this is Hudson at the landing platform. Dr. Sanders just sent down a piece of the photo generator for repair. He said he needs it back immediately. What are you talking about? I just fixed that yesterday. Well, all I know is it's on its way over. I'll modify the lenses and reprogram the system. We should be able to change the wavelength from energy to an 847 nanometer data beam. What do you mean we should be able to? I've never had to make the switch before. <laughs> Great. Let's move. The internet is being overwhelmed. Now, fiber optic cables help to relieve this digital congestion a bit, but it's simply too expensive to wire up the entire planet. So why not use satellites to transmit vast amounts of data by laser beams? Then you can send the entire Library of Congress anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds. Or you could download a dozen Hollywood movies in a blink of an eye. The results of the first tests are awaited around the world. The team from the German Aeronautics and Space Administration have made thorough preparations for this night's work. The time has come. Colleagues from Japan send the final pieces of data, the precise course of their research satellite. In this test, the satellite will transmit data to the DLR via laser. Three and a half hours to go to the flyover. Shortly before midnight, the team activate the reception station on the roof of the Institute. The astronomic dome opens to reveal the centerpiece of the mission, the telescope, adapted with a special device. It's a position marker that will signal to the satellite the exact location of the ground station. This is the reception system for the data laser in space. An infrared camera will help the telescope follow the exact track of the satellite. But even if it all functions perfectly, there are still two incalculable factors. One of them is familiar to every non-scientist. When the satellite's laser beam is aimed at the Earth, it has to pass through several layers of the atmosphere. To see what happens, we have to use a special camera. The laser beam is constantly and repeatedly distorted. We all know this as the heat shimmers on a hot day. This effect can seriously disrupt the stream of information coming from space. And clouds could even prevent today's laser transmission happening altogether. They need a little luck tonight. 
two hours and eight minutes to the flyover. Markus, bist du bereit? A last test of the main procedures. For the real thing, they'd use an invisible infrared laser beam. Tonight, they're using a visible laser. From 500 meters away, a data stream reaches the telescope. The receptor responds. The data have been received. The satellite is about to appear over the horizon. The spectacles protect the scientist's eyes from the powerful positioning laser on the telescope, which is about to fire. An infrared filter will make it visible. The connection to the satellite has been established. The telescope follows the satellite's path. It's traveling more than nine times faster than a bullet. Then the satellite fires its information to the ground station. We are just getting a clear signal from the satellite. This is the technology we can use in the future to transmit huge amounts of information through space or through the stratosphere. Over the coming decades, a completely new communication system will be developed for this technology. Information exchange by laser will be a routine operation. Solar-powered airships could park 20 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Wherever the Earth-bound network is inadequate or is disrupted, they would be able to receive and redirect huge amounts of data. And in contrast to regular radio signals, it's almost impossible to eavesdrop on a laser. A radio signal is inevitably transmitted very broadly and can therefore easily be picked up, while an optical signal is very tightly packed. In our satellite downlink, the signal was only a few meters in diameter. Any eavesdropper would need to be right next to the receiver, which would obviously make him rather conspicuous. Unnoticed by the two superpowers, the scientists on the space station prepare to send their precious formula out into the world. Just a few hours before, they sent a well-disguised call for help down to Earth in the space elevator, in the hope that someone would understand. This message in a bottle has reached its destination. Bob and Li Chao ask Paula for an urgent favor. They need an insurance policy for their dangerous move, and only the world's media can provide it. Paula has just an hour to get the USA's major news networks on their side. The scientists on the space station have no choice but to trust her. You got 30 seconds. Any update on the situation in Central Asia? Not yet, sir, but there's another development. News from space, from the solar research station Solaris. Outside sources have just informed us of a major breakthrough in solar power research. We now go live to Dr. Wang Call and the Dr. President. Sanders on the space station. We've discovered a material that is so efficient, it can absorb and convert three times as much sunlight into electricity as previous materials. Dr. Wang? To verify our discovery, we'll now send the formula via laser beam to laboratories in China and the United States and to the major solar research centers on Earth. Let's do it. A press of a button and the formula leaves the space station. Less than a second later, it reaches a data distribution point that fires it by laser to the whole world. The formula for a better life. I'd like to thank my government for watching over my wife during my absence. I look forward to seeing her when I land. And we wish to thank the leaders of our nations and the European Union for their spirit of cooperation and as well as everyone who helped make this discovery possible, this is for you, 
Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just witnessed history in the making. This is truly a day you'll tell your grandkids about. If you've just joined us, I'll try to recap. Today, on the solar research station Solaris, two scientists have reported a breakthrough that could revolutionize the production of fuel and solve the energy crisis that confronts the planet. What do you think the world may look like in, say, 50 years from now? 50 years? Are you kidding? Who would predict that far into the future? Maybe cities on Mars? Intergalactic travel? Another big, blue, beautiful Earth? The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Confucius? Try again. Another Chinese proverb? Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> ever solve our looming energy crisis and save the planet? Yes, I think it will. But I wouldn't put my money on any one particular breakthrough. Rather, it's going to be an energy mix of solar, wind, hydrogen, fusion, maybe nuclear. So let's hope that we find a way. Because even if we do colonize outer space, it's always nice to have a home to come back to. Now I leave you with one final thought. We hold the power of life and death over our species and the entire planet. No other generation has ever had that power. The good news is we're going to see some amazing medical breakthroughs. Therapies which today are considered impossible could become commonplace in the future. But there's also bad news. The flip side is, if you think that the healthcare system today has too much control over your life, then just wait for the next 50 years. This story from the future begins with Alain Degas. He's a twice divorced doctor. And last night, he celebrated his birthday with friends in Paris. Hi, Princess. One factor distinguishes his life completely from today's. It's ever present and always working, but almost invisible. The home of tomorrow is intelligent and thinks ahead. But the computer said you weren't going to be here until this afternoon. Ugh. But this will have to wait. I got to get to the clinic. Now? Sorry, Princess. But you can thank Dr. Balzac for that. She takes my dream job. Now she's my boss, and today I get to smile and pretend I like it. I'll fix her something quick. So you're sure she wasn't just better than you? Better than me? Is there life on Mars? Alan's house has electronic eyes, ears, and even a kind of nose which tests his breath. Many computers and sensors organize and protect his life. A secretary and a security system all in one. Let's keep this between us. But it's not just his house that casts a caring look over Anna. The computer chips in his flat are networked with the whole city. Right now, the house is ordering Anna food and a taxi. But at the same time, another very powerful organization has access to the apartment systems. Health insurance companies like Personal Care compile electronic personal files on their patients, monitoring their lives in extraordinary Next. detail. Next. The aim is to avoid costs through preventive care and Wait, diagnostic tests. Of the mouth. Send health memo immediately. Bonjour, Monsieur Degas. Here are a few more tips for your dental care. Brush your teeth regularly using the ultrasound toothbrush. This will give away the fact that Anna was partying last night and his premiums will go up as a result. Thanks for your attention. You must be joking. Actually, Anna should be pleased about all this high-quality care because he's had heart problems from birth. Can I go with you? 
No, it's not your speed. Just a bunch of boring grown-ups. Now don't pout. I won't be long. Now please, give me my jacket. You know I need it. Alaz's jacket is crucial for his health because it continuously monitors the state uh, of his heart. Thank you. Get the car, please. Alan's clothing looks quite ordinary, but that's deceptive because woven inside the fabric are dozens of tiny computer chips and sensors monitoring his health. When he puts on his clothing, he goes online. Now get this. If he's ever knocked unconscious, his clothes will automatically identify his coordinates, alert the authorities, and upload his entire medical history before the ambulance arrives. In the future, you will have a doctor in your clothing. And that may happen within 10 years. Your clothes will be transmitting data around the clock, and they'll send warnings when something is wrong. The man who invented intelligent clothing wants to make bulky ECG kits and blood pressure testers a thing of the past. One of the most important things when we were designing the smart shirt was the ultimate integration between sensing, communication, and clothing. It sounds simple, but the devil's in the detail. The great challenge for the scientists in Atlanta was how to weave the intelligent components into the fabric. Wires and computer chips would have to disappear into the material. From a technical point of view, the first tests were a complete success. But the wires were too thick and very uncomfortable for sensitive skin. It took years for the crude prototypes to become the world's first woven computer. This fabric can now carry gigabytes of information. So let's say I'm an athlete who's training for my Olympics or any particular sport, then I can monitor my heart rate, for instance, using this shirt. And so the information will go from there to this, there'll be a controller here, and from here the information will be transmitted to the uh, point where you want to collect the data. Today, the sensors and the power supply are still clipped on and disconnected when the garment is washed. So this invention is not yet ready for everyday use. But researchers across the world are working to make the idea viable. In 10 years' time, these high-tech garments will be powered by our movements and our body heat, and the software they contain will look after our well-being like a private nurse. They won't transmit all the information they gather, the system will check for danger signs and disturbing symptoms. Changes in heart rhythm, a sudden drop in blood pressure, or even the early warning signs of a heart attack, like a dangerously blocked artery, will in future be transmitted directly to the nearest emergency medical center. 50 years from now, everybody, from little babies to senior citizens, will be wearing this kind of clothing that can enhance the quality of life for them. And in fact, uh, if a person is involved in an accident, that can actually save their life. But the omniscient home and the medical clothes won't protect our future selves from stress. The taxi's at the door, Alan's late, he's in a rush, and he doesn't notice the busy little cleaning robot. Alain's jacket registers his serious injuries and alerts the emergency center. Insurance status? Give clearance for ambulance. Initiate cause analysis. Alert hospital. Back. Seconds later, personal care has informed the nearest hospital and dispatched a high-speed ambulance of the future. As a kid, I used to watch Flash Gordon on TV and dream about having my own personal flying car. But you know, there are problems with that dream. Even for helicopters, they're bulky, expensive, and tricky to fly. And flying cars have always been problematic. But engineers are now solving those practical problems. And NASA scientists envision the day when we will look up and see a superhighway in the sky. No one has dreamt of flying cars longer than Paul Moller, and no one knows better than him how hard it is to make them work. A good flying car is a vehicle that does a number of things. Takes off vertically like a helicopter, flies at high speed like an airplane, 
and drives for some distance on the road like an automobile. 40 years ago, Moller built his first prototype. It didn't fly, so he started again. The young aero engineer experimented with different engines in his search for the perfect power plant. Soon he developed a new wingless flying machine that caught the imagination of all America, the XM2. This one actually took off with Muller on board, vertically just as he'd planned, but it only went up 50 centimeters. And this first flying saucer turned out to be hard to stabilize. The need to take off vertically is very demanding. You have to have very powerful, lightweight engines. You have to have uh, materials that are particularly strong. All of these technologies are coming along at this time. Moller didn't give up. He built surveillance drones for the army and mufflers for cars so that he could finance a new flying machine, one that would really fly. The new machine needed power. He tried four jet engines. After 15 years of setbacks and occasional glimmers of hope, his dream was ready, parked in his garage. <sighs> 950 horsepower for a weight of 700 kilos. Theoretically, it could streak through the sky at 600 kilometers an hour, if it took off at all. The first test flight. 12th of July, 2002, these pictures were transmitted all around the world. Paul's success was hailed as the first small step towards NASA's great vision, that in 50 years, half of America's automobile journeys will be made by air. A lot of people get concerned because they've got this vision of all kinds of vehicles up in the air, but actually, if you took all the cars on the road in America today and put them there, they'd still be miles apart. But uh, you'll see, a computerized world where you're not flying it, you're just sitting, you're playing computer games, you're reading, um, you're sleeping, doing whatever as you're delivered from point A to point B. NASA is already working on a management system for private air traffic. Programmers have developed software for private pilots that aims to make flying as easy as driving a car. The routes are displayed in the cockpit navigation system, just like roads. NASA has given it the catchy name, Highway in the Sky. The highway in the sky system gives you a lot of confidence that you really are where you're supposed to be. And it just makes you feel more comfortable and then you fly better. Guy runs a test on the simulator to show just how well the program performs. Guy's a computer programmer and has never piloted an aircraft before. They make it harder for him by introducing wind turbulence. But Guy can steer just as if he were on a road and has no problem maintaining altitude and direction. But intelligent highways in the sky won't be enough if hundreds of thousands of cars are aloft at the same time. Most likely, all planes will soon be steered automatically by satellite transmissions to prevent accidents and aerial traffic jams. The engineer's biggest concern is the landing. No machine has yet equaled the skills of an experienced pilot. It's fairly easy to keep the plane flying relatively straight and level. But as you get closer to the ground, that's where the accidents happen. So the industry is now developing an automatic landing system that will work without pilots and without air traffic controllers. Runways will be laced with tiny computer chips, which will transmit exact approach details to incoming planes and will even factor in weather conditions and any other special obstacles. A program in the in-flight computer will then land the plane. Imagine a future where this advanced navigation system could be linked with the autopilot to make the aircraft autonomous enough to fly from where it knows it is to where it knows I want to go. And you can imagine a day when an aircraft like that is used for search and rescue to help your friend Alon. In 50 years, flying ambulances should save emergency doctors and paramedics precious time. There will be no traffic jams and they can land anywhere. Patient data registered, Alan Dega. Platinum class confirmed, loss of blood, 35%. I suggest reversible death. Okay. 
If, like a lamb, the victim has lost a lot of blood, there's a risk of cardiac arrest and oxygen shortage to the brain. The doctors have just 10 minutes to stabilize his condition, or he has virtually no chance of surviving. After a serious accident or a heart attack, every second brings us closer to death. So wouldn't it be great if somehow we could stop the clock? In the future, EMTs will use a technique called reversible death or suspended animation. They will replace your blood with an ice cold saline solution, dropping body temperature to 50 degrees Fahrenheit when brain and heart activity come to a halt. This technique is now being tested in the laboratory and one day could save your life. With his body thus cooled, Allah can safely be transported to the hospital of the future. Later, when the doctors have closed his wounds, he'll get his blood back and be returned to consciousness. Sorry for calling you away from your party. Never hesitate. This is more important than cocktails. Start the gun. Before the operation, his injuries are thoroughly examined. New diagnostic techniques reveal a lot more than broken bones and internal injuries. The body scan will also flag up abnormalities like tiny tumors or narrowing arteries. Diagnosis. Suspended animation, no brain activity, abnormal cardiac function, heavy compound fractures, contusion of the spine, paraplegia likely. Not looking good. Okay, let's get started. Insert the sensors. With this injection, Anna's recovery takes a big new step. It contains microscopic electrodes that attach themselves to the nerves in his muscles. About 150 electrodes are needed to build up an intelligent network in his body. The signals are gathered by computer chips along the spinal column and transmitted to a chip they are about to implant in Anna's brain. Then Anna will be able to walk again. What in the world? Next day. Last time I saw an artificial heart was in 2040. This one's even made of real polymers. Looks like it took a hit. It's tearing near the energy cell. Clear case for a new heart. How's he insured? Platinum. Good for him. It's to go. Oh my gosh. Your biggest rival. Only yesterday he was ripping you apart. Whatever. He was banking on getting the job. Well, he's my patient now. I'll need a tissue sample for the new heart before we bring him round. Okay. A week from now, this cell sample will have become a medical miracle. Meantime, Alan is recovering from his operation in the luxury of the first class section of the hospital. If today's predictions turn out to be accurate, he'll be paying almost half his income for this premium service. You have a daughter. This may come as a shock to you, but there are people who have a life outside the clinic. Listen, Degas. Please, let's Dr. Just... Belzac, just tell me how it looks. Your left thigh has been fractured and your hip is dislocated. Two ribs and a second lumbar vertebra are also fractured. But you have a bigger problem. Let me see. I am a doctor, please. Your artificial heart has fissures. You're going to open me up? You need a new heart. The print's already in progress. It'll only take another 20 hours. You're not carving me up. Not you. As you wish. Doctor. Iris scan identified. Marie Balzac. Status cleared for security zone. Have a nice evening. Meanwhile, in the hospital's top security department of genetic medicine, Alain's cell samples have developed in new ways. In a series of complex steps, his stem cells have been transformed into eight different kinds of heart cell and cultured billions of times over in a nutrient solution. In the future, this technology could solve one of medicine's biggest problems. A simple comparison makes the point.
If your car gets banged up in a car accident, what do you do? You go to the body shop and get a new door or fender. But if you happen to be in that same accident, you could die. Now consider this. In Europe alone, there are 40,000 patients on the waiting list for an organ transplant. And of them, 10 people die every day for lack of an organ. What we need is a human body shop. And in 50 years, tissue engineering could change everything. Tissue engineering actually means growing tissues. No one yet knows how to grow a whole organ, but many doctors and researchers are working on different elements of the task. Stefan Jochenhövel is the first person to try culturing a biological heart valve. It's a huge challenge. A healthy heart valve lives through three billion heartbeats and has to pump 250 million liters of blood. Tissue engineering is an exciting young discipline. Its aim is to move away from mechanical spare parts and to biologize things more and more. That is to replace, little by little, artificial materials with real organic materials. Every heart valve that Jochen Hervel grows is made to measure. First, a mold is crafted. This will be a child's heart valve. Now the valve is cast, as the doctors put it, and that happens in two stages. First, a solution of heart cells and protein is poured into the mold. Then a substance is added that works on the protein mix, like an instant glue. Just one hour later, the tissue is stable enough to open the mold and gently peel out the valve. But it's still not finished. It's put in a bioreactor to accustom it to the constant beat of a heart. At body temperature and with a constant supply of oxygenated blood, the valve must now work on until its cells have matured. Left to themselves, cells are lazy. So you can't just grow and mold the cells, you also have to train them. And that's what we do in the bioreactor, like in a little gym where the cells learn to do their job. Jochen Hervel reckons it'll be another 10 years before his heart valves will be beating inside a human body. Organic spare parts made to order. But you could never make a complete human heart this way. The arrangement of the billion cells involved is simply too complex. So researchers are looking for a different way to build this miracle of organic engineering, cell by cell. Biologists and engineers in the US had an idea that sounds crazy. To use the good old inkjet printer that creates each letter out of hundreds of tiny ink dots. Why shouldn't it work with cells? We didn't change much, first of all. Um, this is a conventional inkjet printer, and so what we do is we change the cartridge quite a lot. We take the ink out, we'll modify it so it can accommodate our cells. We rinse it and so on, and sterilize it as well. Um, this is one thing. The other thing is where the paper feeds, usually we use a special bio paper, a kind of a gel, and so we had to um, modify it a little bit over there so it can accommodate for that paper. The first test was to write the name of the university in bacteria. There were two critical questions. Would the bacteria survive the printing process? And how precise would the result be? The research team had an anxious six hour wait before they could see the results. Well, what we see is the pattern that we printed previously. Uh, the green light is just the fluorescence of the cells. And that shows basically that we did two things. One is the cells were printed where we wanted them to be printed. And second is the cells divided so they survived the printing process. The next stage was even more critical. Boland adapted the printer so it would build three-dimensional structures. Living tissue made from animal heart cells. The first printed heart tissue was finished in barely a minute. It amazed even the researchers. But the toughest test was to come. 
could these heart cells really beat? Thomas Boland carefully applied an electric current. What we see here are a couple of layers of heart cells that we printed using our printers. And what we want to do eventually is to print an entire heart. Uh, we may achieve this in 50 years or so, but uh, there are a number of things to overcome. The uh, ability to print capillaries, for example. But if we overcome those obstacles, and I think we will, then this could quite be possible. Even the immune system, our body's firewall, would be fooled by organic printed spare parts made from our own cells. Tissue rejection would be a thing of the past. But Marie has other things on her mind. Patient come on. Anna's old artificial heart is on the point of failing. for earlier. I... I guess I'm just a sore loser. You are the biggest little boy I have ever met. Diagnosis confirmed, Doctor. <laughs> I have to go. The night shift's always understaffed. When are you working tomorrow? Night. Tomorrow afternoon I'll be busy partying. Egg and spoon races, pin the tail on the donkey. It's my son's eighth birthday. There was life beyond the clinic, you know. <laughs> hey, then he's a Scorpio. Just like me. Two days before Alan's heart transplant, personal care does another review of his case, and the operative comes across an inconsistency. Next. The information comes from Alain Degas' intelligent apartment. Please include in the record, patient Degas Alain, inconsistent test results. Urine sample from 7.34 a.m. does not match urine sample taken at 12.20 in our hospital. Probability of manipulation, 80%. Request detailed check, groceries, trash, and contents of refrigerator. Suspicion of alcohol. Run. Alain's little trick has caught him out. What a way to celebrate your birthday, Dr. Degas. Uh -huh. Alain, I, I think we should be on a first name basis. Okay. Marie. Anyway, how is my heart coming? Okay, come on, I'll show you. Wait a minute. This is really good. Well, I have to admit, I did make it with real butter and real flour. No. We are sitting on a time bomb, one that could explode in our faces in the coming decades. Quite simply, people, especially in the Western world, are getting too obese and are eating their way to an early grave. In the United States alone, 10% of its annual health budget goes to treating obesity and its effects. Unless this problem can be solved, this could break the bank and sink the economy. However, in the future, bioengineered foods and advanced genetics, they may come to the rescue. But to do that, we must solve one of our body's best kept secrets. Why do we like to eat things that make us fat? Scientists at the Wageningen Center for Nutrition have vowed to find the definitive answer to this question that tortures so many members of the human race. Test subjects are put under observation. Their brain activity is monitored, the reaction of their pupils analyzed, and their blood pressure checked. Without knowing it, this test subject is about to eat a typical low-fat product. This yogurt has just 0.2% fat. Though he hasn't been told, his tongue recognizes the truth instantly. Within seconds, his pulse increases. He's not pleased. This food is unsatisfying. 
The electrodes reveal interesting changes. They register values that can only be interpreted one way. This is stress. The body is reacting negatively to something it doesn't like. This judgment seems to come from our genes. If we eat a low-fat yogurt, our bodies react with an alarm signal, stop. This doesn't contain enough energy, it's not good for me. But we seem to be really happy when something feels crispy on our tongue, because crisp equals fresh. And we shouldn't underestimate the effect of an extra portion of fat. 11% fat. Mmm, we like that. We're not imagining it, it really does help us. However, these nutrients contain a lot of calories, so we're trying to create products that relax the body without calories. So Rob Harmer's team is searching for the magic substance that will fool our sensitive tongues. This device mimics the tasting process, and Harmer is using it to test his latest creation, a low-fat pudding combined with an additive. These are extreme close-ups of a tongue. On the left, without the additive, the small amount of fat is distributed in fine bubbles. On the right, we see the additive at work. It makes the bubbles expand and dissolve, so the tongue tastes a creamy texture with almost zero calories. But perhaps we can trick not just our taste nerves, but our genes themselves. Researchers are working on this vital question all over the world. The puzzle they're trying to solve is one a lot of us would like to have the answer to. Why do some people simply not put on weight? To find out, a team from the University of Maastricht weighed a group of 20 volunteers, analyzed their genes, and calculated their body's fat content. Then they were fed. Each one was locked in a cell and given three solid meals a day and all sorts of sweet things in between. The airlock has one great advantage. In the three by four meter cell, the scientists could constantly check oxygen and CO2 levels. If oxygen consumption suddenly rose, that would indicate secret physical exercises. And in this experiment, that was banned. This participant kept strictly to the rules, and yet, after 21 hearty meals, he'd only put on one kilo. Other guinea pigs had gained as much as four kilos, and their genes all shared the same distinctive feature. Part of their genome had suddenly become much more active than in the case of the lightweights. Their bodies created large amounts of a particular protein. This protein is responsible for the weight increase. Scientists are now looking for a food additive that can act as a break on this genetic fattening. We hope that through this research in 50 years, it will be much easier for people to stay as slim as Alain. 24 hours before Alain's transplant operation, the last few thousand cells of his new heart are being printed. Tomorrow it should be beating inside his body. Aha, my friend. Degas Alain, suspicion of manipulation confirmed. Cancel insurance coverage immediately. Confirm. Degas Alain, cancel insurance coverage immediately. 18 hours before the operation, a physiotherapist is working on Alain's still paralyzed limbs. Can you move your leg? Okay, Monsieur Degas. Now I'll activate the chip in your head. In just a few moments, the computer chip in Alain's brain will make contact with the electrodes in his paralyzed legs. Let's practice some walking. Monsieur Degas, let's get started. Now, focus on moving your legs. Ready? Here we go. Just imagine raising your left leg. We all remember the tragedy of Christopher Reeve the actor who soared into space as Superman, but died helplessly in a wheelchair because of a spinal cord injury. 
Today, there are hundreds of thousands of patients worldwide like Christopher Reeve who are also paralyzed. But in the future, we will have a computer chip that connects the brain directly to an arm or a leg, bypassing the injured spinal cord, and the paralyzed will walk again. However far away that may seem now, neurologist John Donahue has no doubt it is coming. For 20 years, he's been working with computer experts to analyze the patterns of human movement. He now knows the language of the brain that makes all these movements possible. It consists not of words, but of millions of individual electronic impulses. The smallest action has its own highly complex code. The long-term goal was to see whether we could mathematically decode or translate the brain's language into something that a computer could understand and use. Matthew Nagel is a former football star, paralyzed from the neck down since he was stabbed. He volunteered for a daring experiment with Dr. Donahue. His greatest wish is to become a little more independent. Matthew agreed to have a chip implanted in his brain. The aim was to use this chip to capture movement impulses deep inside the human brain for the first time. During the surgical procedure, our goal was to put this tiny sensor uh, into the arm area of the motor cortex, the area of the brain where arm signals, arm movement signals are generated. So this tiny platform sat on top of the brain and the electrodes about one millimeter long would then go into the brain to pick up brain signals. So what we had hoped is that we could then record the patterns of brain activity that were still remaining after spinal cord injury. And in particular, we were interested whether just thinking about moving would allow us to drive a computer or other devices. Two weeks after the operation, Matthew tried out the system for the first time. He was linked to a PC, and his job was to move the cursor with just the power of his thoughts. The result was astonishing. I'm going to open the first email, which says congrats. It says you are doing a great job. Now I'm going to the exit. Next, I'm going to paint a circle. Matthew's microchip represents a huge medical advance. That's the best circle I can do. Now I'm going to exit. But that was just the first step for the research team. Their next generation chips should understand a lot more of the brain's instructions. Now the programmers are concentrating on decoding the signals for hand movements. They use infrared cameras to analyze the movements. If they succeed, paralyzed people will soon be able to direct artificial limbs with their thoughts. Yet the hand is not only the most useful of our body's tools, but also the most complex. 20 joints, whose movements can be combined in millions of ways. Discovering the codes for all of them and translating them for the computer seemed to be impossible but that would actually be too complicated for the human brain as well. What we find actually is that the human hand can be described by a much lower dimensional representation, about six degrees of freedom. For example, you can't move the joints of your fingers independently. The first and second joint of this index finger move in concert with each other. And what we're searching for is how all the fingers move together in a coordinated fashion to try and uncover the representation the brain might use to move the fingers in that way. Open. Close. Not bad, man. Not bad at all. Close. The hand. Open. I think we're at the beginning of this age of neurotechnology, and what I want to see is that we can have a physical repair of the nervous system. And what I mean is that someday you'll be sitting here interviewing someone and they'll be moving their hands, they'll be walking around, they'll be talking, and they will tell you that I'm in fact spinal cord injured, but I've been repaired by a brain gate chip in my motor areas that have reconnected my arms and my legs, and I play sports, I, I live a normal life. Now when I let go of you, just think of walking. What were you thinking? What? Maybe I should come back in a few minutes. What's the problem? The results for your urine tests before and after the accident don't match up. You manipulated them. 
I had a few drinks in mind before. I was just trying to keep my premiums down. I want personal care are refusing to pay a dime. You know what that means. And I. You're not insured. You're not only the biggest child I've ever met, you're also the stupidest. What about the transplant? Cancelled. They're going to tell you that the old pump will hold up and in two years you'll get a replacement of schedule. But you said it was defective. Monsieur Dugas, I'm sorry. This is the lowest class of hospital service. Monsieur Dugas, let me help you. For the first time, Anna experiences the real meaning of multi-class medicine. Anyone who's uninsured or underinsured runs the risk of descending into the healthcare underworld. I'm Dubois. Afterlife management. I've come to make you an offer. Afterlife management? What kind of an offer? I'm still alive. I'll take a few cell samples. Here, here right now. And then? And then we'll clone you. And you'll be reborn again. As what? It's only a matter of time, perhaps within a decade before we have human clones. Remember test tube babies? Back in the 70s, people denounced test tube babies as the work of the devil. Well, today we hear the same arguments against clones. Now, clones can be banned, but how do you stop a black market in clones? Maybe you have a rich man with no heirs. What's to stop him from willing all his money to himself as a child and starting all over again? Now, clones raise all sorts of moral issues. Do they have a soul? Do they have rights? Can they sue their genetic counterparts? The debate has just begun. Well, if you do change your mind, please, please, just please give me a call. Alain's first night in the pauper's ward begins. There's no prospect of help. Now the insurance has been canceled. The hospital should really destroy his freshly printed heart. Several floors above, Alain's fate takes an unexpected turn. Oh, no. A cardiac arrest in platinum class. The 61-year-old patient cannot be revived. Jacques Martin's transplant was scheduled for the next day. morning, Marie takes a risk that could end her career. She succeeds in slipping Alain into the platinum class operating suite. His brand new, freshly printed heart is ready. Now, who have we got here? Isn't that one of our colleagues? Jacques Martin, born 4595, 90 kilograms, platinum level. Heart transplant with engineered organ. Can you believe he's 62 years old? He's in good shape. Monsieur Jacques Martin. Concentration, please. Everyone ready? Patient hypertherm. Marie will not touch the patient once during the operation. Body temperature 46 degrees. Blood completely replaced with plasma solution. She works on a virtual 3D model of Alain's body, which she can enlarge at will. She changes instruments using a computer menu. Stop. Computer rejecting data. Seems like we've got the wrong patient. Uh, 
There we go. Piece of technology junk. No kidding. In years to come, high-definition images like this from inside the body will revolutionize surgical techniques. One click and the scalpel becomes a saw. While Marie opens the virtual patient's rib cage, the robot arms carry out the real incision on Alain more precisely than any human being could. But in 50 years, we will still need surgeons. They will never be replaced. Are all the main arteries blocked? Yes, you can remove the organ. Fifty years ago, some scientists predicted that robots will push the human out of the operating room. Well, that may never happen because every patient is different. Robots cannot anticipate the unexpected. They cannot adjust to new operating strategies. So for you parents out there, hoping that your kids become doctors, keep on saving money for medical school. In the future, there will be surgeons in the operating room. And it's gonna be the human-machine partnership that will perform miracles in the hospital. Even today, there are hundreds of routine operations that would have seemed impossible just a few decades ago. At this hospital in Leipzig, in Germany, more than 3,000 open-heart operations are carried out every year, magnifying spectacles and precision instruments. The incisions are getting smaller and smaller to improve recovery times, but even experienced surgeons are now reaching their limits. Any surgeon, of course, operates very precisely, but even this isn't always enough for modern surgical techniques. When we are operating inside the patient with long instruments, we have to move with an exactitude of a millimeter or even a fraction of a millimeter. Therefore, we need instruments that can mimic the natural capabilities of a hand. This surgical robot is being tested in Leipzig. Its scalpels and tweezers are just a few millimeters in length. It's being used in a bypass operation on a pig's heart. A steering console transmits the surgeon's hand movements to the miniature instruments. The slim robot arms have one great advantage. They make open heart keyhole surgery possible. One of the arms supports a camera filming the site of the operation while the surgeons cut millimeter by millimeter. A hydraulic system makes the surgeon's hand movements smaller. Each movement of the scalpel is just one-fifth of the surgeon's original action. Manipulations that were too fine for human hands have now become possible. There's still one problem with the system. If the doctor makes a mistake, the robot does too. But even that could soon change. The Leipzig surgeons are working with engineers to develop an emergency brake to prevent mistakes in the operating theater. The first stage is to provide a position marker for the instruments. The patient is fitted with an infrared sensor. Then the surgeons can outline exactly which areas they intend to work on using a virtual 3D model on their computer. Danger zones are marked off limits. Next, the computer is linked to another infrared camera that's constantly monitoring the positions of the instrument and the patient. A symbol representing the patient lights up to give the go-ahead when all systems are linked up and running. In a real operation, every millimeter would be critical. Using a normal drill, the smallest shake of the surgeon's hand could damage sensitive nerves and could paralyze the patient's face forever. But this system watches over the surgeon's every move. If he gets too close to the limits of the operative area outlined in blue, the emergency brake cuts in. The instrument is switched off before nerves or arteries can be damaged. Systems like this will be able to filter out shaky hand movements or sudden jerks and turn them into smooth movements of the instruments. 
So in spite of her temporary attack of nerves, Marie will be able to operate skillfully on Allah. We're running out of time. The fiber and glue will harden in five seconds. Fiber and glue solid. Okay. Unblock the main arteries. All open. Can I revascularize him? Yes. Inject his own blood. Quickly, please. Injecting. 2.5 liters per minute. Two channels. It's not beating. Blood pressure okay? I'll stabilize him. Please close the thorax. If I can afford all these high-tech treatments, I personally wouldn't mind living to be the ripe old age of 200 years to see beyond my years, to see the future of the human race. And how about you? Well, one thing we know for sure, hold on to your hats because in the next 50 years, it's gonna be a wild ride. <laughs>